On this Tuesday night, feeling the heat. Record high temperatures fueling fires and causing travel troubles in Europe. This is pretty extreme. As humidity cranks up the heat in parts of Canada, the message from meteorologists, disaster and disbelief. And it's, it's absolutely insane. The powerful storm that pummeled an Alberta community calls for a life-saving solution. The push for a three-digit suicide crisis hotline. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Scorching temperatures are sweeping across the globe, affecting millions of people. Parts of central Canada and the prairies are now under heat warnings. And the mercury is even higher in Europe with record-breaking temperatures that one French meteorologist is calling a heat apocalypse. The UK shattered its hottest day on record, with temperatures there hitting 40.3 degrees Celsius in a village north of Cambridge. The German town of Barrel hit a sweltering 39.3 degrees, marking that country's hottest day of the year. And in France, temperatures topped 40 degrees in Paris, the second hottest temperature ever recorded in that city. Here in North America, more than 100 million people in the United States faced heat-related warnings or advisories today, with temperatures reaching 43 degrees Celsius in Dallas. And Environment Canada has issued heat warnings for Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario and Quebec, with very high temperature or humidity conditions and severe thunderstorms expected in the coming days. We have comprehensive coverage of the extreme weather. Our reporters are in the hot spots here in Canada, the United States, and in Europe. We'll have more on the situation here at home in just a moment, but we begin in the UK. Our Redmond Shannon is in London, where the city's fire brigade has now declared a major incident after a surge of heat-fueled fires in the British capital. Redmond. Jeff, firefighters remain at the scene here and in many other locations across southern England. Record-breaking temperatures that turned many parts of this country into tinderboxes. A neighbourhood in flames on a day when Britain baked. As temperatures topped 40 degrees in the UK for the first time on record, fires flared up across southern England. Remarkably, this blaze began right beside a fire station, but in these conditions, there was little the firefighters could do to save some of the houses. In the parched weather, the mayor has urged Londoners not to light any barbecues or fires for the next two days. This is not about us being in any state of party poopers. It's the reality of accidents happening and fires starting and spreading rapidly. Train travel has been disrupted for a second day due to fires and tracks buckling in the heat. We've had to change hotels this morning because the trains were not running, so we've had to get another train. At least 29 locations in the UK registered temperatures above the previous record of 38.7, many of them above 40. Even climate change campaigners are surprised Britain reached this scorching milestone so soon. Over the last two years in particular, we've seen so many really disturbing weather events that climate change, the science of climate change has been validated in the public mind. Their hope is that events like this will trigger stronger action on climate. It will not be uh, a tipping point if politicians don't really react. Records didn't just fall in England. Scotland broke its all-time temperature record on Tuesday too. The good news is that on Wednesday, temperatures will drop considerably, remaining in the mid-20s here in London. Jeff? Redmond Shannon in London. Thanks, Redmond. The intense heat is also fueling hundreds of wildfires across Europe. At least two people have been killed in Spain in blazes the Prime Minister is blaming on climate change. In France, wildfires have ravaged the southwestern part of the country, forcing thousands to flee their homes and leaving some areas in total ruins. Firefighters in Greece are scrambling to maintain a wildfire north of Athens, which is now said to be threatening homes in a suburb of the Greek capital. Here at home, heat warnings have been issued across four provinces, stretching from central Canada to the prairies. Now, we're not expecting to see temperatures on the scale they're witnessing across parts of Europe. But as Mike Drolet explains, officials are still urging Canadians to take precautions. These days, the beach isn't just an escape. It's a reprieve from a humidity-fueled heat wave, making Ontario and Quebec feel like an oven 
and putting paramedics on notice. I think the biggest thing that we tend to see is an uh, um, increase in calls related to that. So um, individuals who are calling in with uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. Gauging the temperature can be tricky for a lot of people. Environment Canada measures the true air temperature by putting its thermometers in the shade. So while it might feel like a high of 31 here and be quite pleasant, when I go into the sun, the true temperature for me, because of the direct sunlight, is probably closer to 40 degrees. And the message from meteorologists and climate scientists, get used to it this year and every year. So this is not something foreign to us, but it's getting more frequent, more intense, longer lasting, occurring earlier and going later. And so we clearly see what the future is. The future is more of this. I was okay without an air conditioner till about five years ago. And then it was like, oh yeah, <laughs> you need it. Like I can feel it getting hotter and hotter every year. Adding to Ontario's woes right now, a lack of rainfall. If that doesn't change soon, farmers warn the food chain could suffer. Corn stalks, for one, aren't as tall as normal. Without moisture, the kernels won't develop on the cob. What we could end up with is just a green stalk or possibly even just a, a cob with a few kernels on it. So it will impact everything from feed for livestock to feed food for human consumption. For Jim Clark and Margaret Long, the trend towards hotter summers led to them prioritizing a dream vacation. That's why we're going to the Arctic. Yeah, because if we don't see it now, it's not going to be there anymore. A hot summer with slow burning implications. Microlight Global News, Toronto. Southeastern Alberta is reeling after a fast moving, powerful storm swept through that region yesterday. Holy! Wow, take a look at this video. A full size trampoline carried by the wind bent in half around a light standard. Heavy rain and strong winds pummeled that area yesterday, knocking out power and destroying homes and vehicles in its path. Our Dallas Flex Hog is in Cypress County tonight with more on how those communities are coping. Dallas. Jeff, it's sunny now, but the damage left behind is proof that this storm packed a powerful punch. A view from above shows what Mother Nature can do in an instant. Over half a dozen homes are wiped out by what Environment Canada is calling a gust front that packed 140 kilometer an hour winds. We just bought this one three months ago. On the ground, Helmut Doring is left surveying the damage of what used to be a workshop filled with antique Studebaker cars. It was a building, yes, and now it's a pile of cars. Have you ever seen anything like this? Only on TV from the disasters down the states. It was just totally white with rain. But Helmet's strong. son, Ed, also had a close call. And then I heard this crash and looked behind me and there was this tree branch that was sticking through my roof. What were you thinking? Uh, what do you think? You think, holy, hopefully I make it through this, that's all. So are six construction workers who took shelter in this trailer before it was tossed 30 meters and crushed. Amazingly, they all survived. The trailer is a mess. I don't know how they walked out of it. And it's ins absolutely insane. Nobody was hurt or is unaccounted for in this storm, although some livestock was lost. Thousands throughout the county dealing with downed trees and power outages. Crews have been working around the clock to restore. Cypress County says it is still in recovery mode, surveying just how much damage was done. It is absolutely a tremendous uh, loss and uh, uh, it's a shock. The biggest thing is that there was no loss of human life and uh, it's, uh, we can rebuild, but we can't replace a person. So it is devastating, but we have to, we sometimes have to count our blessings too. The county has teamed up with the Red Cross, offering accommodations to those who can't go home. And as the cleanup begins, those here say they will get through this as a community. Jeff? Dallas Flex Hog in southeastern Alberta. Thanks, Dallas. And this heat wave is also fueling calls for action on climate change. Global warming is making these extreme weather events far more common. The United States is one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases. And as Jackson Prosco reports, the American president is expected to announce new measures aimed at the climate crisis. Dangerous heat is so widespread in the U.S. that nearly 100 local temperature records have fallen so far this summer. 
We're certainly seeing more extreme weather uh, due to climate change. Yet in steamy Washington, D.C., it's clear the American response to the climate crisis is quickly wilting with much of President Biden's climate agenda blocked by a senator from his own party, Joe Manchin from Coleridge, West Virginia. I haven't walked away from anything, uh, and inflation is my greatest concern. Add to that a recent decision by the U.S. Supreme Court limiting emissions regulations on power plants and President Biden's own visit to Saudi Arabia, where he pushed for more oil production, and one of the planet's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases is on a path to inaction. There's no sugarcoating it. They are major setbacks. In recent polls, 70% of Americans said climate change is a crisis. More than three quarters of the population reports being personally affected by extreme weather. Yet when it comes to the top issues facing the country, just 2% of Americans mentioned climate change. We absolutely should not be putting a lot of action on climate change. 30 years ago, it was a problem for the future. It is a problem for now. With no clear political path forward, President Biden is set to take executive action on climate change and may eventually declare a national climate emergency, as dozens of other countries have already done. Yet the president also risks having any of his unilateral moves overturned by the courts. That leaves the world's leading economy on course to miss its once ambitious emission reduction targets, a dangerous gamble for a planet in peril. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. A day of thunderstorms and torrential rain in New York City led to this startling sight. A sinkhole opened up on a street in the Bronx, growing rapidly to swallow a parked van. Residents say this is the second time a sinkhole has appeared in the same spot. The last one took more than a year to repair. The Prime Minister calls it absolutely unacceptable. Coming up, how Hockey Canada allegedly paid off sex abuse victims. There are damning new allegations Hockey Canada kept a fund that could be used to pay off sexual abuse victims. Right now it's hard for anyone in Canada to have faith or trust in anyone uh, at Hockey Canada. Uh, what uh, we're learning today is absolutely unacceptable. As first reported by the Globe and Mail, an affidavit from an Ontario case suggests the national body kept money in a separate account to pay for uninsured liabilities, including potential claims for historical sexual abuse. This multi-million dollar fund was financed by player registration fees from across the country. Last month, the federal government and corporate sponsors paused funding to Hockey Canada following the organization's settlement in an alleged sexual assault case involving members of Canada's 2018 World Junior Team. In an emergency, Canadians can call 911, but pressure is mounting on Ottawa to establish a new three-digit hotline specifically to help prevent suicides. On average, about 10 Canadians die every day by suicide. The House of Commons voted in favour of establishing a suicide prevention hotline back in 2020. Tonight, Morgan Campbell speaks to one survivor who says a hotline is long overdue. 30 years ago, John Karens lost his arm and leg when he was run over by a train in a workplace accident. Incredibly, he survived and says he was given a second chance at life. I have been an individual that had to kick my way out of that wet paper bag of suicidals. Across Canada, people like Karens are speaking out, calling for the establishment of a three-digit suicide prevention crisis line that connects people to mental health experts. A reduction of the barrier between them and getting help can make a life-saving difference. The United States recently launched 988, a three-digit national suicide prevention hotline. Mental health experts want to see something like it in Canada. I'm really hoping that um, our government continues to, to push for this. Consultations between the federal government, CRTC and mental health stakeholders are underway. At least 10 Canadians die each day by suicide and while it does not discriminate, data shows men, boys and Indigenous youth are disproportionately at risk. How do we know 
that the very people that are going to need it are going to be able to uh, have access to it because there are probably still some remote communities that don't even have cellular service. Some critics argue Canada isn't meeting the mark when it comes to suicide prevention as we still lack a national suicide prevention strategy. We need a strategy that's backed by actual timelines and real funds. So that strategy is sorely lacking in Canada. There are people out there like Karen's who dedicate their second chance to helping others. But a three-digit hotline would be another tool to help, one available 24 hours a day. Little did I know the sign that said dead end on the other side, it said just the beginning. Morgan Campbell, Global News, Coburg, Ontario. And if you or someone you know needs help, you can call Talk Suicide Canada at 1-833-456-4566. Support is available 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Airline passengers who are already dealing with long wait times and flight delays may now face another travel hurdle. Random COVID-19 testing measures returned to four major airports today. The federal policy is back in effect for international arrivals at Montreal, Toronto, Calgary and Vancouver airports. The testing requirements were paused back in June. Those selected will now be tested at an off-site facility and if found positive, they must isolate for 10 days. Political pipeline pressure. Ahead, will Russia cut off Europe's critical energy supplies? Welcome back. Western European nations are now scrambling to make contingency plans, with uncertainty clouding the future of one of their largest sources of energy. The Nord Stream 1 pipeline is expected to go back online this week after a brief outage for annual maintenance. But as Abigail Beeman reports, it's not clear if Russia will agree to restart the flow of gas. European governments are planning for all energy possibilities. What we're watching is a game of political chicken between the Russians and the EU, uh, with Germany being on the sharp end. Tuesday morning, Reuters reported state-owned Gazprom will allow at least some gas to flow Thursday after maintenance is completed, work that required Canada to bend sanctions and allow turbine parts repaired in Montreal to be returned. A controversial move. Where did the Prime Minister's office, where did the Cabinet um, see a win for Canada in all of this? Uh, there's, there's some uh, explanations uh, or some suggestions that uh, Canada did this to uh, ensure the uh, unity of, of the alliance. Um, that's not the case. The Prime Minister says it is about unity, maintaining the decision was difficult but correct. So Russia will not succeed in either weaponizing its energy or dividing uh, our allies amongst ourselves. We are focused on being there to support Ukraine. Disagreement among a group of high-profile retired generals, part of a new advisory council working to get the right military equipment to Ukraine. I'm in uh, broad agreement with Canada's decision. It was a very tough one. I'm, I'm a slight bit, I think, more harsh on the Canadian government decision. Rick Hillier hopes this doesn't signal allies easing pressure on Russia, but he's not so sure. In hindsight, it may be seen as the straw that broke the camel's back. Meanwhile, a new reality for Europeans in the coming months. You're going to see really high gas and electricity prices this winter across the EU, almost guaranteed. Russia's next move, still a mystery. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Vladimir Putin is making a rare trip abroad for face-to-face -face meetings with the leaders of Iran and Turkey. The visit to Tehran is the Russian president's first trip outside the former Soviet Union since he launched February's invasion of Ukraine. Topping the agenda, a deal with Turkey to allow the resumption of grain and the conflict in northern Syria. These meetings are also being seen by some analysts as a sign that Moscow plans to strengthen its ties with allies in Asia in the face of Western sanctions. And that is Global National for this Tuesday night. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight's Your Canada is the Northern Lights over Tobury, Ontario. We love seeing Your Canada, so please keep emailing your pictures to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.